Thank you for taking the time to learn more about hospice. At Compassus, we serve with heartfelt compassion. We do more than care for our patients. We honor them with dignity and respect. Over the next few moments, I'm going to help educate you on hospice services and how your loved one can receive our services at no cost to them. Hospice is a medical benefit service where patient and family-centered care is provided to individuals with a life-limiting illness. When the decision is made to no longer seek aggressive treatment such as chemo, radiation, dialysis, and they would prefer a more palliative or comfort care approach, service can be provided within one's own chosen surroundings, typically at home. Hospice is about living, not dying. Once a physician certifies that the normal course of a disease process is less than six months, Compassus can help. Even if the disease process is greater than six months or the patient improves, the benefit is not lost and hospice can always be reinstated at a later time. Some common diagnoses for hospice are as follows. Cancer, end-stage pulmonary diseases, end-stage heart diseases, end-stage Alzheimer's or dementia diseases, renal failure, liver failure, CVA stroke, ALS, adult protein calorie malnutrition, or end-stage HIV AIDS. Keep in mind these are the most common, but any life-limiting illness has the potential to qualify. And although hospice is commonly used by older individuals, even newborns are eligible for service if they qualify. Also important to know that anyone can request a hospice consultation simply by calling our office or a hospice care consultant. We will work with the patient's physician to get the documentation to prove eligibility for services. Many people don't understand the benefit of hospice, but it actually began in the 13th century in England, Paris, and Florence and was run by religious orders. It was in 1967 that Dom Cicely Saunders adopted the more modern hospice program in London, England. This was called St. Christopher's House. In the late 60s, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross published a book titled Death and Dying, which delineated the five stages of grieving, drawing much interest in helping people who were in need. In 1974, the first United States hospice was established in Connecticut. In August of 1982, Medicare adopted the benefit, and in 1986, Medicaid also adopted the benefit, drawing more people to utilizing the service as it was at no cost to them. It wasn't until 1983 that the conditions of participation were enacted, and I'm going to explain more about those in a little bit. They were most recently revised in 2008. So many people, including those in the medical field who may have gone to school before this time, are very unfamiliar with how our services work. A hospice team consists of many different individuals with different expertise, as you can see pictured here. A lot of people think this is a very sad business and wonder why would anyone choose to work for hospice. There are many different reasons, but first I'd like to tell you a little story. Once upon a time, twin boys were conceived. Weeks passed and the twins developed. As their awareness grew, they laughed for joy. Isn't it great that we were conceived? Isn't it great to be alive? Together, the twins explored their world. When they found their mother's cord that gave them life, they sang for joy. How great is our mother's love that she shares her own life with us. As weeks stretched into months, the twins noticed how much each was changing. What does it mean, asked one. It means our stay in this world is drawing to an end, said the other. But I don't want to go, said one. I want to stay here always. We have no choice, said the other. But maybe there's life after birth. But how can there be, responded one. We will shed our life cord, and how is it possible without it? Besides, we have seen evidence that others were here before us, and none of them has returned to tell us there is life after birth. No, this is the end. Maybe there's no mother at all. But there has to be, protested the other. How else did we get here? How do we remain alive? Have you seen our mother, said one? Maybe she only lives in our minds. 
Maybe we made her up because the idea made us feel good. So the last days in the womb were filled with deep questioning and fear. Finally, the moment of birth arrived. When the twins had passed from their world, they opened their eyes and cried for joy, for what they saw exceeded their fondest dreams. So there you have it. The number one answer is hope. Offering hope to individuals is probably the biggest reason that people decide to do this work. Other reasons that I got from my team were managing pain and suffering, giving quality of life, turning a bad situation into a more bearable one. When treatment options fail, people deserve dignity and respect. To provide professional guidance and a quote from our executive director to make a person's last sunset as beautiful as their first sunrise. So what controls who receives these hospice services? It's called the Center for Medicare Medicaid Services, and they've created what is called the Conditions of Participation. Their purpose is to prevent fraud and abuse, ensure quality care to appropriate hospice patients, and ensure patients' rights. As a hospice organization, Compassus follows these very strict guidelines to the letter to ensure that we will never be shut down and patients will be left without care. So let's talk for a moment about what does hospice care provide? Well, first of all, you receive an interdisciplinary team to provide overall care for the entire person and their family. Number one, it consists of a medical director who oversees the care of the patient. Then you have an RN who is the case manager coordinating between the medical director, patient, family, and the rest of the hospice care team assigned to the patient. Then you have LPNs, which may do fill-in visits with patients who require added care. However, the RN is required to visit a minimum of once every 14 days. We also have CNAs to help with things like bathing, dressing, grooming, mealtime feeding, and other duties scheduled by the RN. A medical social worker can assist with resources in the area that a patient may not be aware of, but possibly would qualify for and making them more comfortable. Additionally, the social worker will help with the documentation and paperwork to ensure the patient's wishes are being preserved and final arrangements are in place. Spiritual and bereavement counseling. These are non-denominational representatives who can aid in the emotional effects faced by patients and their families. Bereavement counseling continues for designated family members for 13 months after the patient has passed on. Physical, occupational, and speech therapy, as well as dietary counseling, can also take place if ordered by the medical director. Then there are volunteers, which can be very beneficial to patients and their families, providing a non-connected outlet to talk to, as well as relief for the family to run errands or attend appointments and a variety of other things. Next, hospice provides the durable medical equipment required to maintain the comfort of the patient. Things like a hospital bed, bedside table, bedside commode, shower chair, wheelchair, walker. Also, medications related to the patient's diagnosis only and laboratory and diagnostic testing related to the diagnosis if it is approved by the hospice physician. Then we provide supplies such as incontinence supplies, bed pads, and oxygen, and a 24-hour hotline. Hospice is not in the home 24 hours a day, but it is only a phone call away. Since hospice holds your insurance benefit, we become your 911 for all health care questions and will instruct on a solution or provide an unscheduled visit whenever necessary. So where is hospice care provided? Well, there are four levels of hospice care, the most common being routine hospice care, and it is held wherever the patient resides. This can be at home in an assisted living or a skilled nursing facility. The team comes to the patient. Patients are able to come and go from their home whenever they are able. There is also respite care 
in a skilled nursing facility. Under the conditions of participation, a patient can receive up to five days of respite care per certification period to allow the caregiver a much needed break or allow them to be away from their caregiver duties for personal reasons. Once a patient is accepted to hospice, they are certified for 90 days. Then they must be evaluated and if appropriate, they have another 90 days. After that, the certification periods are every 60 days until they are no longer qualified or pass on. There is also general inpatient care, which is for patients who have a unique situation, typically something like uncontrolled pain, where they can remain on hospice service and stay in a contracted hospital to get that situation under control. This is a very short five day or under stay. Continuous care is used only in a crisis situation and happens rarely but can aid in the dying process to keep the patient comfortable and assist distraught family through the process. So who pays for all these services of hospice? Well number one Medicare in many cases, Medicaid in almost all states, managed care such as an HMO, or private insurance including the VA. A person can also do private pay and we do sometimes accept non-funded based on the consideration and caseload we are currently carrying. So this sums up what hospice is all about. Please use my contact information listed here to reach out and find out more about the unique program that Compassus has to offer for you, your patient, or your loved one.